Dr. Goh had counted on a common market with Malaysia because of Singapore's small domestic market. Barely 17 days ago, I had the privilege of presenting pioneer certificates to 33 manufacturing enterprises. The inclusion of a further 44 new manufacturing enterprises in such a short space of time is ample testimony of the genuine benefits which Malaysia and the common market will bring to Singapore. But that was not to be. Despite earlier agreements for a common market, Singapore continued facing restrictions when trading with Malaysia. Differences over tax and finance also exacerbated tensions over sensitive race issues. In 1965, after two stormy years, Singapore was out of Malaysia. Dr. Goh had a part to play in the separation. He had been asked by then Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew to press for a looser arrangement for Malaysia and Singapore within the Federation of 14 States. But Dr. Goh went beyond his mandate. Having concluded that the only way out was for Singapore to exit completely from the Federation, he negotiated for a total hiving off with then Malaysian Deputy Prime Minister Tun Abdul Razak instead. Back in 1965, there was no time to dwell on the whys and wherefores. Singapore had to survive on its own and fast. Building its economy and its defence were urgent tasks. In 1968, the British announced it was pulling its troops out of Singapore in 1971. That was another crisis. In 1972, they would spend nothing for they would all have left. The total reductions in expenditure for the four years, 1968 to 1971, is $900 million. $90 million in 1968, $180 million in 1969, and so on. If these uh, things were allowed to take the natural cause, the result would be a severe and protracted economic recession. But the fighter in Dr. Goh was not to be defeated by either the separation from Malaysia or the British pullout. He accelerated Singapore's drive to become an export-oriented economy. When we separated from Malaysia, we got hold of some people and myself. He said, look, we must earn our living from as far away as possible. He said, never earn our living from our neighbours. He, he told both of us that. And that's why we went to scout, scout for investment from the Americans, the Japanese, everybody, you see. Because the moment you, earn, you have to earn your living from your neighbours, you know, just like uh, neighbours always quarrel with each other. So that was our strategy. Our strategy was the world. Dr. Goh was equally prescient when it came to the currency talks after separation. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and Finance Minister Lim Kim Sun had favoured a common currency with Malaysia. But Go King Sui, he, 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 he was very, he was very, I think at that time it looks to, to us to be very hard. He said, look, there will always be a, break, there'll be a breaking point in this currency talks. So you better hope for the best, prepare for the worst, and we prepare for the worst. That's how within six months of the breakdown, or one year, we issue our own currency. Going its own way on the currency issue gave Singapore full control over all its monetary and financial policies. When a strong financial system was needed to support the many foreign investors brought in, Dr. Goh gave more licenses to foreign banks to operate in Singapore. It was during this time that uh, the uh, Asian currency unit, you know, the offshore US dollar uh, currency unit was established in Singapore and uh, other financial measures were undertaken to make Singapore more hospitable for, uh, uh, for big financial operations. So the Development Bank of Singapore was set up as a financing institution led by the government. Dr. Goh also set up Jurong Town Corporation to drive the industrialization strategy. And he agreed to tax concessions at a time when it wasn't popular to do so. 
Certainly, um, when you make tax concessions, it is always a very difficult decision to, to make because, you know, I think uh, it is seen as losing revenue. And it is also an irrevocable, irrevocable step in the sense that once you've given a concession, it is very difficult to take it back. Despite this forward bold move, Dr. Goh was at heart a very prudent economist who believed in the currency board system. He believed in spending only what the country had and in saving a good bit on the side. Even up to now, uh, we cannot just print money as we like. He never believed in deficit financing. And for every dollar that we print, it has been backed up by at least an equivalent of one dollar of foreign exchange. This prudence led to a significant growth in savings in Singapore. He was very tight-fisted and I think that was reflected in the way he ran uh, the state. Every time wages were allowed to go up, more and more was put into savings, into CPF. Now, that was very much uh, uh, not just Dr. Goh, but the, the then Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, both of them felt very strongly that all this money should not just suddenly be given to the workers uh, to be splurged, but that they should build up their savings. And of course, they can use their savings to buy uh, homes, invest and so on, but it's basically not consumed. A person who's had a narrow escape with his life soon sees marriage in the habit of prudence. This is exactly what happened to us. Machiavelli in The Prince said this, men with their usual lack of prudence are fond of innovations and liking the first taste fail to see the poison within. Having failed at the beginning of our political career to see the poison within, we are always on the lookout for poison in new situations. This wariness led to another preemptive shake-up, this time at the Monetary Authority of Singapore, where Dr. Goh had been appointed chairman in 1981. When I was there, he, uh, I think the Prime Minister at the time, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, asked him to look at uh, whether we were uh, managing our reserves well uh, at that time, then uh, he uh, um, did a review of the MBS and decided to set up the uh, GIC because he felt that uh, this would lead to more effective uh, management of our reserves. And I think that turned out to be right. He was far ahead of his time uh, setting up an independent uh, an investment management firm uh, in order to manage the government reserves uh, which were not needed for currency uh, controls. And Singapore did amass large reserves from just one billion Sing dollars after independence to over 22 billion when Dr. Goh retired in 1984. On one occasion we happened to be in Bangkok for some conference. And one day in the hotel lobby, I saw him panting and puffing and coming into the, from, uh, in the hotel door, uh, uh, sweating profusely. So we asked him, you know, what did you do? I mean, why, why are you uh, in, in this state? And he said, I've been walking for the last uh, four blocks from the hotel because I wanted to hail a minicab and uh, they wanted to charge me an atrocious sum. So I forget what the sum was, but for us it was very little money, but to him it was quite a lot. This same frugality had led Dr. Goh to propose establishing a bird park before a zoo. I said, why a bird park? Why not a zoo? You know, he said, oh, Gyeong, don't you think that seeds cost less than meat? Bird seeds cost less than meat. It's that kind of, you know, Rob, he used the term robust approach in economics or in budgeting. Robust approach. But Dr. Goh was concerned with more than just practicalities. Here was this bird park right in the centre of an industrial estate and we thought if the birds cannot survive, 